Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I am joined by one of our favorite and most requested guests on the program, Father Turbo. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Good to see you again. Good to be with you good, again. Good to, good to see you again. Again, everybody loves when you come on the program. Uh, everybody loves everything you do. It seems like you've been making the rounds on the podcast, and you're sort of a, a fan favorite. Oh, well, I'm humbled. I'm humbled. Uh, everybody likes a little bit of uh, chocolate, I guess, after dinner. So. <laughs> <laughs> that That's probably exactly what it is. Um, today, I, I asked you to do a convo. I know that you also write icons. Mm -hmm. And so the premise that I wanted to lay out, um, the title of tonight's stream is Fighting the Devil's Iconography, sort of playing off uh, Blessed Father Sarah from Rose talking mm -hmm. about how pornography is the devil's iconography. Right. And I wanted to talk, really introduce people to orthodox theology of icons and iconography, how that relates to our worldview, but then get into these black mirrors, get yeah. into these cell phones, television screens, computer screens, and how, in a way, the devil inverts this reality of iconography and gets people in a way to lose their personhood by consuming those sinful images, which is essentially dissipating those energies of God over and over and over. So sure. um, to begin with, uh, wherever you want to go, start with an introduction. How would you explain to somebody, both Protestant and Orthodox, what iconography is and how it relates to our theology? Sure. Actually, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to start somewhere a little bit more anecdotal and personal. Yeah, always, um, always. I came to the Orthodox faith through the icon through the icon. Um, it's a story some people may know or may not know, but just really quick, my wife um, had some friends that she had managed their pizza parlor for a number of years. And so, you know, good, good close friends, you know, uh, God bless you, Moon. And so um, they had invited us over, they wanted to get to know me. And we walked into the house in the foyer, there was this Ponto Crater icon. Mm. And, um, you know, it's like I got slain in the spirit. As the charismatics say, it's like I almost just wanted to pass out. Um, <laughs> I saw, you know, it was just this explosion um, that, of energy that just went right through me. And I just stopped dead in my tracks. And I was like, what is that? You know, and, wow. and, and really, you know, it was already kind of bad enough, me being a weirdo, you know, being tattooed and all that <laughs> stuff. They're like, okay, it's bad enough he's this weirdo. Like, he hasn't even made inside of our house yet. And he's like losing his mind. But I was like, what's the deal with that picture? I'm like, oh, it's an icon. I said, okay, like, well, what's an icon? Like, oh, it's a picture of Jesus. And I said, I can tell it's a picture of Jesus, but something's happened here, you know? Um, and I was an artist, you know, um, at the time. And, you know, I mean, my clientele, I was known as being a Christian tattoo artist and all this stuff. And seeing this, I'd never seen or encountered anything like it before. And that led me into a whole... I was a very bad guest that night because I didn't want to hear about anything except for what's still with that picture, that quote unquote icon. Are you guys mm -hmm. Catholic? Like, like what is this? It's not like anything else I've experienced before. Long story short, he handed me a book by Father Anthony Clonaris um, called Introducing the Eastern Church. I took it home and I read it in one night, cover to cover. Wow. And I was like, OK. And the big problem was I didn't disagree with any of it. You know, um, everything made perfect sense. And the, the icon was the vanguard. It was the, the tip of the spear that really hooked me. Now, that being said, I will say that also now as an Orthodox Christian and as a priest, the icon is the most underutilized um, form of evangelism, expression, prayer, mm -hmm. um, communion with God and his saints underutilized absolutely um and with that kind of playing in the background 
let me say what the icon is. The icon, it is a window into heaven, um, but it might even be more appropriate to call it a mirror also in some regards, mm -hmm. because I think that, well, first of all, let's unpack a window to heaven first. Well, why do we call it a window to heaven? And you know how I get, uh, you know how I get, don't let me get too far on the rabbit trail. Let, let me get no, back to We love the rabbit trails over <laughs> here. So go <laughs> into the weeds. Let me, let me, don't, don't forget to kind of reel me back to the mirror. I'll, that, okay. Important. I'll keep it on track. You go wherever you feel called. Great. The window to heaven should be understood like this. If you guys and, you know, in the audience are looking, I mean, even look behind DPH, look at the icons mm -hmm. there. Every icon there has one thing. A person with a halo. Mm. What is heaven? Heaven is the gathering of human beings who are united in love with God. Mm. That's how we should understand the halo. The halo is the wedding ring, if you will, between God and the saints. God mm, and I've humanity. never heard it put that way. I, I like that. <laughs> And so yeah. every icon is a window to heaven, meaning heaven is the gathering of people and God together in love. That's what heaven is. Mm. And that's what every icon shows, is the gathering of people united, theosis, deification with God. That's heaven. Mm -hmm. That's what heaven is. Right. 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 So the icon is a window to heaven. It shows us who and what we have always been intended to be and also who and what we will be and become in Christ. Mm. And that's gonna play out later, obviously, when we get back into the mirrors, we get back into how the devil's trying to in, not only invert that, but distract people from that destiny, from that right. goal. Right. Another way that the icon is a window into heaven is that it shows us the scenery. It shows us the transfiguration of creation right it shows us the transfiguration of the imagination it shows mm. us the transfiguration of you know our ontology our being mm -hmm. when you look into an icon you see the eschaton you see the mm. transfigured reality right you, you begin to experience it so the icon promotes and exposes the viewer to this realm which is largely unseen it's mm. largely unseen and the icon gives us the schematics to begin to articulate what it is that is unseen and what it is that is just buried so deep and latently in us mm. you know if you if we were to explore some unknown you know dark chasm of the underwater we're getting, getting into sci-fi whatever and we were to see fishes or even you know creatures that we had never seen before, our minds wouldn't even have category. We'd try to find something to articulate our experience, which may or may not be an approximation to what's actually there. If you're following, you know what I mean? Right. You will fill in the gaps. The icon starts filling in the gaps for us of mm. that unseen realm, right? The icon provides for us the material and the means by which we begin to see what is unseen, what is this inner kingdom of heaven, right? And it isn't right. in a Gnostic sense, just completely right. disembodied, right? With just simple thoughts and ideas, it's it's incarnate. And that's right. the thing I wanna land on, is that it's important because it reveals that the incarnate reality of Christ is one that we also participate in, right? right. As we all know, matter matters. You know, <laughs> right. And so this is what the icon ushers us into <laughs> is that, you know, all of creation, as St. Paul talks about, is groaning in expectation of the revealing of the Son of God. But we are getting that foretaste of that groaning and that that fulfillment now. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we first and foremost begin to bring in and usher in as priests, not just, you know, the kind of sacramental priest, but just the priesthood of believers. Right. When we look mm. at the wood and the paint and the gold leaf, we're bringing in the material reality as priests and offering it back to God and saying, you know, Lord, here, this, this is us bringing back the earth to you. And right. so 
I would say that's another aspect of the icon in regards of evangelism, because it isn't always about bringing people who are outside the Orthodox Church to the Orthodox Church. It's oftentimes bringing those of, who are, those of us who are already Orthodox to this place of renewed conversion. Mm. If we wanted to, every time we looked upon an icon, we would have a conversion of faith. We should be living every liturgy as we're coming fresh from the tomb like the apostles. Right. We should be experiencing the icon as we are laying our eyes freshly upon the Lord. And so right. hopefully at the end, of the, you know, at some point in time, we'll talk about, I, I think there's practical steps that we can do to help us get into that too. Because for a lot of people, you know, a lot of Orthodox, they, they don't mean to, but they can kind of dull their appreciation and dull their ability to, to you know, enter into that kind of prayerful place with the icon, you know? And so I think that's just as important as understanding the theology of the icon. It's the experience of how do we pray? How does the icon right. lead us into prayer? Well, you've mentioned before that, you know, I've heard people, non-Orthodox, criticize iconography as, oh, it, you know, it needs to be more realistic. It's not hyper-realistic. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak to some of the differences between Eastern, Byzant you know, the Byzantine theology of iconography versus where the Latin West goes with statuary and more realistic mm -hmm. uh, personifications of um, well, of everything, really. I mean, e even, you know, Naked David, uh, the mm -hmm. statue by Michelangelo. Um, why why does orthodoxy not engage in some of these uh, ar artistic displays? And is iconography different from art? Hmm. Yeah, that's those are all really great. I think um, I think there's a couple of things to look at. First and foremost, um, if we were to pull up, um, you know, like you have a icon, the crucifixion behind you. But mm -hmm. if we were to have, you know, a picture of a quote unquote more Western rendition of the crucifixion and we were to compare them side by side, you would begin to see very quickly um, the differences and the distinctions which which lay not just in the kind of quote unquote style, but even in the, you know, quote unquote theological perspective of what's being conveyed. Um, yeah, so these I would mean, be Western styles. Be Western style. to... and, and really, I mean, if you pick any one of them and then just pull one of them up, you know, um, what you have, this is, see, this is an interesting one because there's these fantastical elements that are there, which are actually, you know, kind of nice. And I, I want to digress a little bit and say this. One of the things that we can, that can be problematic is we can go too far as Orthodox and say that there isn't any room for a more quote unquote naturalistic rendering of icons. When in mm -hmm. fact, you know, there are icons that do have a more quote unquote naturalistic rendition. I mean, there's a lot of Russian icons that look like right. that, that are, you know, the curse screw icon is, is one of the ones that has a more um, naturalistic rendering. Um, mm -hmm. But the essence, and the ethos behind it is still different because mm -hmm. what's being communicated oftentimes in the Western uh, rendering of the icon is it's trying to put a port or, or put forward like a, a, por a portraiture. It's trying to capture something that's happening in the natural realm exclusively, right? Mm -hmm. So in this one here, there's some elements that are trying to be communicated uh, a spiritual reality, um, some supernatural stuff going on with the light and the kind of wind. But again, it's even though it's trying to communicate that, it's communicating it in the lens of eyes that have not been transfigured, if that makes mm. sense. Whereas yeah. when, you, when you pull up a traditional Byzantine icon of the crucifixion, um, what you begin to see is that the what's being communicated isn't just simply the otherworldly transfigured reality of what happened, but with eyes that are, you know, destined to be transfigured as well. Mm. Right. And so here, another thing that's that you'll see consistently is when the Orthodox depict the, cru the crucifixion, we present in an icon, Christ is the one who his life was not taken from him, but he laid it down. Mm. Whereas when you look at some of the some of the other um, 
Western renditions of them, Christ is this agonized victim. He's a victim who was, yes, he was brutalized, but he's a victim in the sense of he was killed by the state. And we see the agony of a human being, although innocent, dying. Mm -hmm. That's not the king of glory that's dying. Right. It's, 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 it's a victim of, you know, state oppression, right? right? There may be an aspect of that for sure. There's a layer of that to our Lord's crucifixion, but that's not the whole story. And so Western iconography, as opposed to Orthodox iconography, tends to have more of an agenda that's based in a kind of very, <clears throat> excuse me, temporal, limited perspective. Mm -hmm. Whereas the quote unquote uh, forward perspective, some people call it inverse perspective, um, some of the more, you know, flat or quote unquote 2D aspects, even the use of hierarchical scale, which is, you know, having certain um, aspects of the icon being larger than others, the disregard for the conventional um, laws of, you know, perspective, the conventional laws of quote unquote art, that is intentional to show this breaking out, this um shall we say this unfolding reality of god being all and in all mm -hmm. and so the the icon uses some of these um narrative aspects if you will to kind of bring us into it and so you know you can see also that this is very much for us orthodox we all find it um conducive to prayer Right. You know, this this ability to be in a place other than just, you know, anchored here in the body, but a body that's anchored in eternity. And that's right. what that's what the icon is, is presenting to us. Right. And I also love like you mentioned when you began that all these icons have persons in them. Uh, my godfather, his wife, one of the things they mentioned was bringing their grandkids to church. They're Orthodox. They always came to an Orthodox church, but their parents were Protestants. So mm -hmm. when it was time for, I forget what celebration, they were. the family was all meeting at the Protestant church. And when uh, the kids went and the grandparents normally take them, often take them to the Orthodox church, they, they got there and they looked around and they saw the barren walls and they said, where is everybody? <laughs> and these were the little kids. And, and it gets back to this idea of this emphasis on personhood theology, which is the beginning of our ordo theologia as Orthodox. Right. And that when we participate in the liturgy, we're participating with all these other holy persons uh, because we're entering into a point that's outside space and time together. Um, well, so, it's real. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's 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 real. And that experience of where is everybody? I'll tell you another little anecdotal story. When my wife came into the church, we had, at this point in time, we'd been in the church for a couple of years. And we were attending a um, homeschooling conference in Southern California, where we were originally from. And it was at this kind of transition point in our lives where we hadn't been back to an evangelical church for probably a couple of years at that point. There had been no need to. We didn't have any friends getting married or anything like that. And we were in this, this large church, and there had to have been an easy, I mean, easy 500 people there minimum. Um, and then, you know, about halfway through the kind of conference and everything, I look at her like, it feels empty, doesn't it? She's like, it does. <laughs> and we're trying to figure out what it was. And then I looked at her and said, oh my gosh, there's no icons. She's like, yeah, it just, it feels, she's like, we're in a room full of people, but it does feel empty. And so that experience is real. And other wow. people have had that experience, you know? And what does that tell us? That tells us there's something to the communion of the saints and the presence of the saints, you know? Right. And the icon manifests that to us. You know, yeah. Um, before we get into the black mirrors, where a lot of this stuff is going to then connect, um, can we speak a little bit about the energies when somebody's looking at an icon? Uh, how some people are going to be familiar with the energy essence distinction, and I ramble on all the time, almost in every stream, about the engagement with the uncreated energies, and this really being the life of, of an Orthodox Christian. Um, how how does one engage with these uncreated energies through what 
you know, this painted piece of wood. Again, speaking from an outsider perspective, yeah. well, how, how you're talking about love and you're talking about truth and mercy and compassion and logic and reason. And I, I don't get it. How do you guys venerate or engage with you venerate through these windows, but then you engage in this energetic reality through this? I don't understand. Yeah. So the first thing is, is that when you see the face, like the human face as a phenomena, as a thing, right? It's already transmitting something to you. See, mm. let me take a step back. Yeah. And I would even say every human face has the potential to convey to us the energies of God. Mm. The human face is the creation of God. It right. is the symbol that God has put forth for us to enter into communion with him. Every human face is in the, in the, in the regards of its basic makeup, right? It's, that's why evolution is problematic in that sense. It's like we didn't develop these features and eyes because it was the most efficient way for our survival and hunting and all that good stuff, right? We are not in such a way to not only express, but also experience God, right? right? And experience God in a way that just won't completely destroy us, right? So, right. so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happens is that um, we, when you have a, when you have, first of all, when you have a, a, a materialist perspective, right, and you're nothing but just a, 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 a meat sack with chemicals and there's no meaning, right, then you're, then you are able to really pick up what's being communicated to you very subtly and things that you take for granted. So that being said, when you, first thing you, you see when you see an icon is person is a face and even if you don't even if it's a small icon you can't see the expression of the face you know that you're entering into communion right that's what a face is a symbol of so mm. so that in oh, of it, that. that in of itself yeah. begins to draw someone that's that itself is the energies of god being communicated right. through that symbol right, right. of the face right, right. and so you now take that same principle and then you now begin to apply it and build it just like you would an icon, right? You have a material reality that pulls you out of the abstract ethereal aspect of emotion and thought, right? And right. there's something material in front of you. And then now you begin to build up from there. You see shape. You begin to see a person. You begin to see composition color, detail, all these things are leading you deeper and deeper into person, right? right? It's like someone sees you like, okay, you know, love the blue eyes, good hair, got the beard, you know, it's like, okay, but then you open your mouth, right? Then right. are you smiling? Are you snarling at me, right? Are mm. you articulate, right? What what are those, what's been communicated, right? Because remember, breath, right? Word, mind. Right? Breath, right. word, mind. All those things lead people into communion. Right? Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Breath, right. word, mind. Right? Ruach, logos. Right? Numa, logos. Right? right? Nous. Right, right. right? So right. the icon doesn't have the numa, doesn't have the spirit in the sense of the breath. But what it does communicate to us, actually, it does communicate to us word. It does communicate to us order and meaning and purpose, right? And it does it in such a way that it bypasses some of the things that gets in the way of communion. For instance, mm -hmm. right? I may have a certain oh. bias about, you know, periwinkle shirts. I don't like periwinkle t-shirts <laughs> because they remind me of the guy who bullied me, right? Uh. And so... So that right there can bar me from having a measure of communion with you, right? Right. But something about the silence of the icon, it can begin to bypass a lot of the obstacles that we may imperceptibly have, mm -hmm. right? And it right. invites us into something deeper. And again, it's imperceptible. People don't even realize it. That's why when people come into an Orthodox church and they're not Orthodox and maybe even they're, you know, staunch reformists, and they may have a problem and they're just there because they're 
their daughters, you know, married some weirdo Orthodox guy. <laughs> That's right. You know, <laughs> and they're, they're looking around and instead of burning down the temple, like, he, you know, like Hezekiah or something like they're, they're saying, wow, there, there's something about this, that, yeah. that kind of unknown thing that they're experiencing. We're starting to approximate those energies of God. Mm. When we come in after a hard day of work, your boss is giving you a hard time. You don't know what's going to happen because your mom's sick. You're late on your bills. All these things are going on. You walk into Vespers. You smell the incense. Mm -hmm. You see the breaking of the light coming through the window. And you see that image of your Lord with the dancing light of candle in front of it. All of that's communicating to you peace, hope, eternity, mm. beauty. See, beauty is another energy of God. Beauty is right. an energy of God. Beauty is the revelation of Christ. Mm. True beauty is the revelation of Christ. Mm. But when you begin to encounter beauty, when you begin to encounter wisdom, if you seek wisdom, you will find Christ. Right? Right. That is the energy. Those are the energies of God. Those are are the ways that he works and impresses upon us because we aren't just, you know, meat and bones. We do have thought, we do have emotion, but the icon begins to invite us in such a way that the emotions become ordered, that the mm. emotions become um, energized in a way that they were intended to, right? Right. The, there, there is a warm austerity that is particular to the Byzantine icon. It's a warm austerity. That mm. warm austerity, it translates to us as a type of dignity, as a type of otherness, right? right? And this is one of the reasons why, especially, you know, people are so moved by the icons of the mother of God, because she communicates to us through her icon, this dignity and hope of womanhood absolutely but of humanity right. of flesh and blood and it does it in the way like saint isaac the syrian says you know the language of heaven is silence so mm. that is many people's first encounter with the communique from heaven right is this silent invitation and this silent communion with the icon and now I know that I'm using, you know, kind of like flowery language and all that stuff. But like the reality is, is again, I'm speaking to you now because this is my experience. This right. everything I'm sharing with you, I'm sharing with you so freely because this has been my experience. Not only how I came into the church, but how I persevered through my own share of heartache, my own share of struggle, and my own struggle with faith. The icon has been that means of communication of everything I just said. So right. even if you think that my language is, you know, too lofty, the reality is, is all you have to do is just sit silently in front of one and you'll begin to experience those energies. You may right. not be able to articulate them. You may not be able to actually pull them apart, but you'll experience them and you'll know it by its fruit. It'll bring you a sense of peace. It'll bring you a sense of warmth. It'll convict you. Mm. It'll show you yourself. It'll show you where your heart isn't as pure and good as you thought it was. Right. That's one of the fruits of the energies of God. So there are people, you know, like you, who spend a lot of good time, a lot of time trying to get people to understand and to articulate the energies of God, but we can never forget that we need to experience them. Right. First and foremost, you know, experience them. And then once you've had that experience, that's yeah. when you know, the explanation can help us now enter even more deeper into that experience. Right. Because you now at least, okay, well, this is how I'm navigating, you know, through whatever this phenomenal experience was. Right. Yeah. I, I, was, I was, you know, connecting with that. Could you speak to why we say we write icons and not draw icons? Sure. This is part, part of the church. Uh, sort of the way that we describe, and you are an iconographer now, and you've been trained. I'm, I'm not sure if you mm -hmm. want to say where, sure. where you got your training, but this would get into why an icon isn't necessarily just an art piece. 
it's it's a venerative reality. It's a venerative window, a, a tool for our own spiritual development. And there's a concept in Buddhism that I've always thought um, orthodoxy and our and our theology of iconography only allows this concept really in Christianity, and, and, and it's called darshan. Hmm. And it means that when they paint little things of the Buddha, the Buddha can also see them. It comes from Hinduism hmm. with all their idols. And, and again, I'm not promoting idol worship, all this stuff, hmm. but they have a concept that's very interesting, is that once they create it and it's been sort of blessed, it becomes a place in which the deity can also see you and you can see it. And so I was, I was curious if maybe you could speak to how that idea or concept could be sanctified in an orthodox sense. And then why do we write them and we're not drawing icons? Sure. There's, there's a lot there. I'm going to digress a little bit too. And just say this, um, just to be clear, the reason, and, and I'm going to say this is um, one of those things that is, uh, a kind of revelation of what we need in regards of receiving the Orthodox faith more fully mm -hmm. as Western people with our Western minds and our Western dispositions. The, the, the term writing became popularized for us because when you translate the word um, from, the, from the Greek into us, it, it's, it's writing and painting are very similar. Okay. It, it's very similar. However, using the word right actually is necessary for us. And I'll explain to you why. As you already know, as Westerners, we have a very, you know, kind of empirically based uh, way of understanding things, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this distinction of being able to say right versus paint, for us, it is a necessary thing, I believe. Because what it what it does is it 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 does for us being a culture that's being converted, what isn't necessary for let's say a culture that has long been orthodox, like okay. the Greeks or the Russians, right? Right. Because what it's doing is it's taking our minds that have been, whether we like it or not, shaped by the Enlightenment, right? And it's now using that language and communicating to us in a way that allows us to separate the icon categorically and then enter into a place where we can have a greater sense of reverence for it, right? Because when we say right, that automatically conveys to us theology. This right. conveys to us, and, and, I, and I don't use this in a, a negative connotation. It conveys to us... Um, to some degree, an academic insight. It's like, no, this is tested. You know, this is very um, deep, you know, and we need that because we need to make a greater delineation in our culture between the sacred and the profane. Right. We need to do that so that we can come back around and bring them together. Mm -hmm. But we, have, we have to have them separated first. Right. right? Yeah. So, so for us, we need to go through as a culture, as individuals, as, as individuals, as persons, as small communities, as a culture, we have to go, through, as coming into the Orthodox Church, we have to go through this process of understanding things in a way that makes sense to us, right? And so in order for us to get an Eastern mindset or an Orthodox phronema, we, interestingly enough, need to use Western constructs to enter into that. And mm -hmm. a lot of people want to circumvent that, but I think that they end up making that process much more difficult than it should. Mm. Right. Because for right. instance, if you spend a couple of time, spend a couple minutes typing in our icons written or painted, you will have a good amount of work that will say, well, they're written because it's theology and the icon is not a painting in the sense of it's subject to the whims of, right. the, of the iconographer, which it's not. The, the, not. the, the right. icon employs um, artistic um, visual language. And if you move outside of those boundaries or those canons of that language, then it's, indecipherable what you're saying, 
right? right. So you can't have, you know, that's why Christ is depicted within, there's only, a, there's only, a, it's a wide boundary, but not as wide as people think of how you can depict Christ. Because if you go, you start moving outside of those boundaries, right? The coherence, what's necessary to engage in communion is, is lost, right? Which this gets us into a whole thing with gender identity, which maybe we'll talk about later. Yeah. But it, you need that boundary for coherence and the icon presents that, you know? Right. There's a general rule of, you know, color theory behind it. Generally speaking, mm -hmm. there's variation and variation in schools, but there's just a general rule. All that is necessary to articulate something, to communicate something. Now, theology, as we understand it as Westerners, we typically understand it as an intellectual exercise, meaning that it's the taking in of information and the juxtaposition of that information with other information and seeing whether it's valid, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But for the Orthodox, that's not really theology. Theology right. comes about through prayer. However, <laughs> as children of the Enlightenment and children of the West, let's just be honest, we need to have a measure of that intellectual understanding we do right and it's through that intellectual understanding that we can kind of like let it go and then get into the heart mm -hmm. Sansafroni um man this forget the rabbit trail <laughs> Sansafroni he talks about how um modern man in particular western man um approaches God more in, in a more cataphatic way right mm -hmm. that it isn't necessarily the orthodox way to be exclusively apophatic because mm -hmm. out of the weakness of Westerners, there is a measure of the cataphatic that we need, mm -hmm. right? So when someone reads that and you're, if you are steeped in Lossky, which is wonderful, see, it's not an either or, it's a both and. Right. That's, so, the, and that's the beauty of orthodoxy. It's always both and. It's always both and. And so, and again, forgive me, but I'm really interested in, you know, what does it mean for people to come actually into communion with Christ? Right. Sometimes, you know, if you're rigid, you'll break. And there's a rigidity mm -hmm. that a lot of purists want to want to hold that that the church isn't holding, holding right. people to a standard too. So this friend, let me give you another another example I'm talking about. Traditionally speaking, you have a very stern Christ, a very stern Pantocrator in the dome, traditionally speaking. And again, this is Saint Sophroni. He talks about, you know, people today, out of our weakness, we can't really handle the stern Christ like the ancients could, right? When, you know, St. Sophron was an iconographer, as you know. So when you read his notes, right. he's talking about this. He's like, well, there's something to be said for a softer, the softer expression in the face of Christ for right. the Western modern man. Because mm. his sensibilities, his, his, he says, you know, to be frank, the weakness of his psychology necessitates it, right? Oh, wow. So instead of being proud and being like, no, let's just be honest. If this is where a lot of us are at, then I think we need to do what we can. And this is a proper um, approach to, let's say, having the church meet people where they're at. Right. I, I think this is a healthy way of doing it, not in a seeker-friendly, let's emulate the world. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's that's. Nowhere Definitely. near what I'm saying. Right. But, but there is a reality in regards of, you know, the development of the church being in such a way so that the culture that the church is trying to incarnate in can actually be joined. Because in order for that to happen, it isn't just a complete occupation by the church. It's an invitation. Right. So the church is inviting the culture into it, which means that there's a certain weakness on the behalf of the culture that the church is encountering. There isn't the weakness of the church. There's the weakness of the culture. Right. So, so our weakness is we are so um, emotionally crippled as a culture that there's a measure of, um, let's say there's a, there's a measure of warmth and softness that needs to be pushed a little bit further for in the icon. Right. So, getting back to this whole situation of painting and, and what that means. All that being said, the icon can never be a kind of subjective, personal expression of a person's uh, fancy. 
Yeah, some you artistic know, whim. It, it can never be artistic whim because the icon isn't a painting in the sense of art being defined as just the personal expression and, and you know, um, as you said, fancy or whim of the individual artist, right? Right. The icon is communicating truth. And so that's why when we say, you know, when we write icons, it is, I'm arguing, an appropriate term to use, but we have to just be honest about how that came into, into existence. And I'll just say this one last thing on that part. People who are coming to the church need to mature a little bit and not be scandalized by things like that. Right. I'll give you an example. When you look into an altar during the liturgy and you see the liturgical fans, right? Well, the liturgical fans came into use because originally they, they, there was a functionality to, to them to keep flies and insects from the gifts. Oh, okay. And then eventually they become you know, integrated into, you know, the, the procession and things like that. Right. So someone coming from a, you know, a fundamentalist evangelical mindset where they're suspicious of everything that might seem pagan, they would hear that and just be scandalized. But I would say to you, look, no one pops out of the womb this pure Christian. Right. Right. God takes every human being. And in that process of theosis, there's a first a process of purification. And that purification is the burning off of those things that cannot be baptized. Mm. But those things that can't be baptized will be baptized. Right. right. And that's why there's a myriad of saints, because there's a myriad of potentials in which Christ can be manifested, his life be manifested in an individual. Mm. Right. And it's the same thing for a culture. Right. Right. That's why when you look at various Orthodox cultures, there's a thread, right? What is that thread? It's the meta culture, the meta culture of the church, the heavenly church, the heavenly culture. And that that grounded being is running through everything. But you know, uh Romania has certain small T traditions. Right. And even just let's just stick to iconography. Georgian iconography is very different from you know the Novgorod school of iconography which is very different from you know the Saloniki right right and that's okay right right because what's communicated is this meta culture this thread that's running through and like with anything else if you're a part of a culture if you're part of a nation then you understand um those rights and customs and the language mm -hmm. In order to be a part of that culture, which is why it can't just be again subjective. It's not a painting of like, well, this is what I think it is, and I'll, and and you know this too because with the advent of the internet and the proliferation of of images, we see people quote unquote putting their hands to iconography, and you can see automatically like, ah, that's not good, right? That's not good, and so why is that? You can tell because something deeper isn't being. Um, communicated properly. It's not in order. Mm -hmm. You can see certain icons that maybe not technically executed the best, but man, they're prayerful. And you can see some icons that are technically executed well, but it looks like you're staring at a piece of drywall. Mm -hmm. What is it? Right? Because that, that energetic reality being transmitted through the icon. Bingo. 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 And so beyond just the ability to hold a paintbrush the right way, there has to be prayer communicated through the iconographer. Right. That's, that energy is what needs to happen. Yeah. Right? I loved when you were talking about the baptism of some things are going to be in a way burned off. Some things will be sanctified. And when anybody participates in a divine liturgy, they'll, they'll see that the priest comes out. Not only does he uh, incense the, the icons of Christ and the mother of God, but then he turns and he senses the people because right. we are living icons. That's right. And um, this is part of this reality. Again, this energetic reality of which we then are embodiments of the energies of God. And we can be conduits for God in the world. God willing. That's right. Um, could you, I want to get too far though. Forgive me. Cause I know I just kind of rabbit trail. No, off. no, this was great because Go ahead. I want to hit that thing you talked about. Though, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Me. Go ahead. What was that? Uh, that Buddhist um... darshan. So the darshan. idea that when when they're they're whatever their depictions are, but there's a concept coming out of the Sanskrit darshan that 
once it's been venerated and blessed, um, the God can see you and you can see the God. And I was wondering if you could speak to that from an Orthodox right. perspective of these being windows onto heaven. These We really yes. do believe these to be a real window. Yes. And so just to speak to that reality, because when we get to the black mirrors, I want to talk about how they're watching you. Yes. And this Very is good. also a window, but it's a little bit different. Very good. I, I want to get back to that because this is great. I don't know if you're able to, could you pull up an icon of the unexpected joy? Icon of the unexpected joy? Mm-hmm. Okay. And this icon is just one of many that is going to kind of prove the point of this phenomena of it isn't just us looking at the icon, but the icon and, and, and heaven looking uh, at us through the icon. So this icon of the unexpected joy, the nutshell of this story is that um, the, the man who's kneeling there from this icon um, was a man who was not pious, let's say. And uh, he would go every day, he'd get up, he'd, you know, say his prayers, make his cross, and then he would go out. And I think he was a thief, I think, either a thief or a fornicator. And he would go every day, same thing, go, make, make his prayers, and then go out and, and sin wantonly, come back. And at one point, he's, you know, going through his kind of rote cultural ritual of saying the prayers and the icon, the mother God and the Christ turns to him. Mm. And the mother of God begins to speak to him. And if you mm. see it, you know, if you zoom in on it, it's the, the Lord is holding up the wounds of his hands and his side. And essentially, wow. she begins to communicate to him. Every time that you wantonly go out and you sin like this, you wound again, my son. Wow. And so from, from here, he's bowled over, obviously, and he bitterly repents. Wow. Right? So right here is just one of many examples in which the icon is you know, this window going both ways, right? There's so many more that, that are like this um, in regards of, there's also a very famous icon of the mother of God where there was a monastic who was complaining about, I think it was his obedience in the trapeza. And um, he ends up uh, stabbing uh, the icon of the mother of God in the face. And she blinds him. Wow. You know? And he ends up bitterly repenting um, some years and she eventually heals him of this. It's just one of the another many examples in which um, this is what that phenomena is. And, and I would just say this to you, uh, anyone who's listening, you know, this I, I, I touched on this thing, which I think is important as people come in. This sounds pagan. That sounds pagan. Or this phenomena is also in Buddhism or this phenomena is here in Hinduism. Listen, um, those phenomena aren't there because of Buddhism. They're, they're there because they exist. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so that's all that is. And so it isn't as if the church, you know, kind of like Christianizes something. What the church does is it, it, it takes it and it presents it as it was meant to be, as you know, God one, intended it. One of the things that it's funny is because people will levy that criticism. Oh, that's pagan or oh, that's that comes from pagan traditions. May, may they be a reformed uh, Protestant or whatnot. They'll also then appeal to perennial rhetoric about, yeah, oh, yeah. well, you can find this in all the different world religions. You can find this in there. And the thing that uh, I speak about all the time is St. Justin Martyr talked about logos spermaticos, seeds of logos can be found everywhere. But on what, and this is philosophical, what epistemological basis can you make the claim that all these things are pointing to the same truth? They all have to then have a single epistemology. That's logos theology, logos. That's Without right. perennialism just saying, oh, well, they all lead to the same mountaintop. Well, on basis on what basis? But if we say, no, orthodoxy, Jesus Christ, logos theology is the absolute truth. Now you can go and look into the world. You can look into Shintoism in Japan and you'll be able to find truths because God's seeds are everywhere and That's he right. gives he gives gifts to everyone. That's right. That's right. And this is a hard thing for people to understand. And I, I think the reason is, is that people <laughs> forgive me. This is this is again, this is just my opinion. But I find that. When we get into debates, and there's a place for debate. There, there's absolutely a place for debate where I 
begin to get a little leery is what is the goodwill of the person who's wanting the debate? Do you really want truth or do you want to just kind of hear yourself kind of like flapping your gums? Mm -hmm. Because what I find is typically speaking, you know, from the Orthodox perspective, when you're, when, when we are engaged in an argument, we're just trying to help someone uncover the seeds of truth that are there. Right. And people will oftentimes interpret that as arrogance, interpret that in these other ways. But what it is, is the competence is not based upon necessarily the, the skill and rhetoric or, or the intelligence of the person who's presenting it, but the fact that it's true, right? And, and I'm saying that because there's a confidence that I think we should learn to grow in as we desire people to encounter the faith. We shouldn't be scared of being able to have a certain measure of dialogue because of this reality of these seeds are there. And that's what people need to see to recognize. It, it's, it's getting back to the, the issue of language and communicating in such a way that people can begin to understand and that you can begin to kind of like lead them to truth. And that's why icons can have some variance in regards of their expression, you know, let's say kind of quote unquote culturally, but that has to be very carefully measured. Mm -hmm. It has to be very carefully measured. It can't be so completely out of the historical paradigm where what's coherent and what's factual and true is no longer communicated. But at the same time, there's something powerful when you look at a church, whether it's in, you know, Nigeria, uh, Oslo, you know, Moscow, there's something running through that, those icons. And I think this is really key to understand because when we get a, a glimpse of that, we can actually more readily recognize God and the people we're speaking to at work. Right. Do you see what I mean? Because yeah. this, this is the other thing is the icon that's hanging on the wall in the parish, it shouldn't be separate from the icon that's walking around in your house or at work. Mm. The one helps you see the other better. Right. And that's why they're, and that's how they are a mirror for that's us mirror. to see ourselves and, and our, our, our fullest potential, our potential as seen in the eyes of God. That's right. That's right. So let's now move it into the devil's iconography. Um, and you know, we have the very famous quote here from Father Sarah from Rose saying, Pornography is the devil's iconography. And in a way, the sort of pimping out of ourselves, the sexual degeneracy that's everywhere, the pornography isn't just relegated to Pornhub anymore. I feel like it's spilled over into so many semiotic processes in our culture that it's it's all sort of been scandalized and. I, I again, we look at these black mirrors, and I've done streams talking about how technology is lowering literacy rates. Mm -hmm. uh, so, people under a certain age, the literacy is actually uh, on a precipitous decline. Mm -hmm. um, emotional connections amongst people, the ability to communicate. We talked about communion, orthodoxy is all about communion, communion mm -hmm. with God, but communion with each other as the living body of Christ that eats the body of Christ to participate yeah. with the body of Christ in eternity. And so communion, community, communication, these things go together. And we're seeing that it's not the technology is evil because technology doesn't have a will. And so it's not, it wouldn't be orthodox to say, oh, well, we have to become, you know, neo-Luddites. We need to get yeah. off all the, because at the same time, uh, you look at what I hope this program does, what you're able to do is using these same black mirrors. We can also bring light to people. That's right. But it's about changing your perception of yourself and how you relate to the world. And so these black mirrors are monitoring us. They're changing our abilities to relate to each other. They're causing people to become more and more narcissistic. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the big differences between our icons. The iconography that's coming through our television screens, our computer screens, and our smartphones is moving us in a way in opposite direction than these icons. And I wanted to we go wherever you want to go, open this conversation up, because um, this is where I see a real spiritual warfare being taken place in regards to people, you know, maybe, maybe a Protestant or what they want to disregard this as, as pagan. Yet then at the same time, their community, their uh, they are um, 
consuming images that are absolutely detrimental to their own spiritual growth. And this is something that we really need to watch our diet on the consumption of the images that we are seeing all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so wherever you want to go with that, I feel like this is the sort of the devil's iconography isn't just pornography. It's it's this whole inverted system. Correct. And the, by by scandalizing us with sexual images, especially as a man, I'm trying to not engage in sex. I'm trying not to watch porn and masturbate. I'm trying to control myself so I can become a better uh, a better follower of Christ. I want to you know get married and have a family, and yet every time I get on Instagram, every, you know, it, then it hits me with an images, which then hits me with a different energetic reality. It's trying to That's stimulate right. these primal energies as opposed to these transcendent energies. That's right, man. You just hit a lot. Let's see what we can tackle. Uh, <laughs> the, the first thing is, um, I want to throw this out, you know, and this is maybe a whole nother thing, but I just, I don't want to let this opportunity slip by. You need to do one thing if you're going to overcome lust and in particular self-abuse you need to fast not just fast from food but you need to fast from the images and the icon imposes a fast on the eyes mm. that the austerity of the icon right the stillness of it imposes a fast neurologically right it imposes right. a fast visually so i just want to throw this out there kind of forgive me for being pastor on that moment because i want to help you know young people, anyone who's struggling with it. I just want to throw that out there. Maybe we can come yeah. back to it. No, I, I think that's a great point. I don't mean to cut you off, but I just found recently that many Protestant Bibles do not contain Matthew 17, 21. It skips just from verse 20 to 22 because in verse 21, it specifically says uh, prayer and fasting as, as part of the, of the Christian life wow. and how we, how we get to God. Wow. I did not realize that there was a significant portion of Bibles that don't even contain that verse. Wow. Wow. That's demonic in itself. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. Now, that being said, this is really important in regards of this, what I'm about to share here too. your, not your, but our perspective of what our definition of pornography is too limited. Mm. And, and that's why people are struggling getting out of it mm. because oh, their, like their definition of pornography and forgive me, and this is like a PG thirteen episode, but <laughs> no, it's not. Most, yeah, it, it, you know, it it it's oh, something's pornographic if it's explicit, you know, explicit nudity, explicit acts, things like that. Um, I would submit to everyone, it's actually that definition needs to be way more broader, because people are encountering things that are pornographic way more than they realize it, and it's already priming the pump. Right. It, it, they're already operating. You know, if, if you have this kind of spectrum of, you know, 10 being just the most hardcore, like dark web right. porn stuff, everyone's operating on a three or a four. Right. And so because of that, because the sexualized, hyper sexualized um, and disordered because sex is a blessing. Right. But the disordered. um view and and the kind of immersion that we're in everyone's already at this they're already teed off if you will so that's the first thing because x the if the icon not if the holy icon is the manifestation of love of god and 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 humanity right we talked right. about that the wedding ring right mm -hmm. so pornography is the inverse of that in regards to it's the exploitation of, of, of the human. Mm. So if you see pornography as defined as the exploitation of the human being, then you can see, I, you don't need to see a woman in a, in a thong in a bikini. It can be long before that, that you're already engaged on a level of, of, of a pornographic energy, right. right? Because it's being communicated to you in such a way that you are objectifying that person. Right. Right. That is that is the pornography. Right. Right. That is the pornography. Right. And right. so that energy and, and the demons have their own energy, too. Right. They have their own ability to work. And, and the proliferation of images, not only does it take and imbue this this dark energy, which 
um, is very powerful, obviously. We see it's very powerful. Um, but it also begins to, if I can use the term, format our perspective on things. So almost you want to look at it like a virus. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes in there and it begins to reformat the way that the operating system of the human being is designed to function. Mm -hmm. So instead of instead of viewing others and the, the material world as a means of communion, it's a means of consuming. Because consuming mm, is the inversion yes. of communion, yes. right? I no longer look at the woman as a means of communion, not only with her as a person, but with God, right? She's right. something for me to consume. I no longer look at the food as something to give thanks to God and to enjoy the body he's given me and the fruits of the earth and the seasons, you know? It's something for me to consume. It's something for me to consume so I can be distracted and not think about my repentance right right whereas communion leads one to repentance see this is this is one of the things about marriage that people don't understand marriage in orthodox context if it's orthodox will always lead to repentance mm. period, period that's not a maybe right so i would just offer that to anyone you know prayerfully your marriage should lead to some measure of repentance. If it's not, you need to step back and examine, are you living your marriage just purely for pleasure and temporal enjoyment? Because mm -hmm. if you are, yeah, God bless you. But I would say start living with more thankfulness, with a bit more humility, and then your marriage, your children will start leading to this place where you'll start seeing these areas of, of, of need of repentance. That's the fruit of communion. Right. Right. So this pornographic aspect of not just explicit sexual images, but the proliferation of images in the in the intent to objectify the material world. This is the problem because right. that objectification leads us to consuming. Right. And, and, and these black mirrors are are literally severing the not just communicative in regards to language, but communing with other mm -hmm. persons that's right. to a degree. Now, obviously they can be used in the right context. So I, that's one thing I always have to hammer people. Say, oh, well, techno no, technology is not bad. It's the wills that are being transmitted through it. Well, and Jesus was a carpenter, people, right? Huh? Jesus was a carpenter. Exactly. Yeah. Greek is the Greek is tecton. Yeah. Yeah. So techne, <laughs> you know? This is a technique. This is that's it's right. a technique for the transmission of information. That's right. That's what we're dealing right. with here. But all tech techne then can be uh utilized in positive and negative ways based on the technician who's using it. The explosion you look of at the our, of the our church, system. the explosion of the growth of the church. How's that happening in the states? You know, someone told me, uh, which this is just me. I I, I had to kind of I had to humbly dis disagree with him but um, I was talking with someone the other day and he was talking about the the growth of church the growth of people coming to the church and he said it was oh because of the live streams I said <laughs> I said no <laughs> it's not be if anything the live streams kind of took a bunch of people away um but it was technology because it shows like yours that have been getting the word out that's been using technology in a health in a healthy and helpful way to expose people to orthodoxy. So clearly, um, and obviously the Holy Spirit's using it, right? right? Because every, you know, for the most part, every church that is halfway sane is exploding right now right? Uh, in the States, right? So undeniable. It, and it's, it's undeniable. Everybody I speak to, every parish, specifically young men, but young women too. Young women get the short shaft, but young women are coming. That's right. And it's it's about and it's due to the black mirror reality that we're talking about is something within people can sense the disturbance mm -hmm. and, and therefore they're looking for the peace. But they can they also sense peace. they can also sense very quickly the beauty. Yes. Even, even through the black mirror, they can sense the otherworldliness. They can sense something calling them something that's good, that's beautiful, that's true. And that that's kind of like the proof in the pudding of what you're saying is that if it wasn't the case, then we wouldn't see it happening. Right. But these things can, you know, God can and does use anything and everything. Right. Including the black mirrors. Including these black mirrors. 
And I, like you said, I think it is an absolute fact in the United States that every person I talk to in their parishes, and I have multiple priests come on, they're all experiencing the same thing. Many people are coming and they're not coming ill-equipped because That's there right. are there is information. People are then arming themselves, they're learning, they're reading, and then they eventually come to the liturgy, which the liturgy, uh, the way that I look at my job, I'm just trying to get people to go through the front door. Once they do that, they're off my hands. Right. Now you have a spiritual father. Talk to him. That's I'm right. just trying to push them into the right. church, to get That's into right. the church, to go to a liturgy. And, and everything else will fall into place. And, and that's where the spiritual battle takes place, too, because the temptations to pull them away. That's right. And the, and the key thing there, too, is the black mirror leads to the necessity of, you know, the digital black mirror leads to the necessity of that analog reality that you experience in the liturgy. Like any one of us who are out here doing this, we will all say, you know, it wasn't the live stream liturgies that actually hurt people. Yeah, because anything that's keeping people from experiencing the liturgy in person is problematic. Right. right. But anything that's getting people to get to that reality of being in person, experience liturgy, may it be blessed. That's that's the distinction. And that's the difference. And I would say this, you know, um, Pasca is coming up, you know, um, not too long, you know, it, it, it's. Trust me, it feels like it's a while Lent just started, but it's going to sneak up on us, right? Yeah. And Christ is risen, right? Yes, sir. What keep? What's the rest of it? Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down. Death by death. Death by death, right? A little bit of the anti-venom. See? Oh, yeah, I love that. <laughs> I love that. It's a little bit of the anti-venom, right? So although we see these black mirrors, which they are portals to hell, for sure. Right. For sure. And, and that, so that speak, I want to speak a little bit to that because it's causing the severing of communion with people, commu real communion with the community. And that's why people, and uh, I'm not going to get into any details, but more recently here and in, in people inquiring to the orthosphere, there's been some, some larger creators that are still inquirers. Their families are becoming catechumens and they've sort of had some online beef, but these other people who are now mocking and deriding orthodoxy and all this stuff, they're sort of cults of personalities and young men are finding these different communities to belong to. And so many of them are online, but part of what I'm seeing is a, it, there's a graduating to belonging to a real community. And that's actually going to a parish, and that's the Orthodox Fellowship. My community is the 80-year-old lady, the, the young man, the 50-year-old guy who's a Democrat, who I can't stand his politics, yet he's orth. That's my salvational reality, that when I go up to the guy that I know, I, I see a social media post, it disturbs me to even see the stuff that he promotes. But I tell him I love him. I give him a hug. I ask him about his, his family. I make sure that I... That's now we go from these communities of these echo chambers where we get to hear things that we like and we get to deride other people to now it's a lived community where it's face to face with people. And it's within the reality of the church. It's within the reality of Christ. So these black mirrors, in a way, they isolate people into these communities. And it it's also due to social media. You can look at maybe we can get into even the feminism and, and girls dating the social medias. Women have all the leverage in regards to contemporary dating in the world because men, um, unless you have already, unless you're somebody in the world, you have no social standing. And therefore, all the women, they can post photos, they can put something online, they can get all the attention they want. They can get, to, everybody's telling them how beautiful they are. It leads to further narcissism. It leads into the empowering of a feminist mentality. Mm -hmm. And all this stuff is detrimental to relationships, real communion, creating families. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've kind of a lot there. But um, narcissism, one of the key things that I keep seeing coming from these things is the black mirrors lead to narcissism, not just the people on the black mirror, but the people consuming through the black mirror. Well, here's the thing. It's. This is where it gets tough, right? Because some someone could say that we're going to be a little bit contradictory of some things we we're saying earlier. And part of the reality that we have to acknowledge is that everything's still playing out. Yeah. Everything's still playing out. Um, but that being said, you know, the icon is um, 
removed from the potential of a subjective projection in a way that the black mirror facilitates. So the black mirror, you it, it divination. There's two things: divination as a problem, and the technology is designed in such a way to facilitate that problem of divination. Don't let me get too far from that because mm -hmm. we'll have to pull that apart too. Okay. But the second thing is this um, self-actualization, self-realization um, of the, the individual, the person that the icon is antithetical to. There's an objectiveness that is found in the phenomenon of the icon that is at, that is really actively worked against in the reality of how you use the phone. I can create my avatar to look the way I want. Mm -hmm. I can get the angle. Remember, I remember back in the day of MySpace, they were talking about the angles. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I can curate and create whatever image, whatever persona, however I, I want it to be. Just that reality of not only being able to do it, but knowing that I can do it distorts the human person. Mm. See, yeah. when you look at an icon, the mother of God, there's a subjective reality in the sense of my relationship with our lady is different than yours, right? Mm -hmm. But she isn't, you know, Joni. She isn't, you know, uh, Margaret. It's like, She's our holy lady. She's the mother of our Lord. You She's not my, some social construct that is divorced from your perception and my perception That's is right. the same person. That's right. That that objectiveness, it's this grounding of reality. And one of the fruits of the proliferation of images, the proliferation of the quote unquote creative uh, potential that's found in the in the power of the phone and in the computer is that it leads people to this disintegration of reality, right? Because mm -hmm. this whole subjective approach reality is nothing but a lie. And right. it's leading people to madness. Right. Right. The icon of the church grounds people back into reality, right? right. All of the things that have, if you want to know what's necessary, take a look and see what society is attacking, mm. right? Society's attacking um, fatherhood, yep. masculinity. masculinity. But watch this: society is now attacking motherhood yep. and femininity. Yes, traditional fem. Oh, absolutely. More so, I would say more so the masculinity now, because transgenderism, to me, is an attack on my daughters and my sisters. Yes. I say this all the time that the, the transgender, the boys competing in girls sports and then girls becoming boys, the, the common the, the common element is that men are now dominating the, the category of woman. And it's, I mean, it's I just saw the U.S. Powerlifting Association has just allowed a transgender woman to compete powerlifting the bone density between male and female, whether you take hormones or not unreal. It's the reality a, we're living in. It's unreal. And it's it's intentionally it, it's demonic. Yeah, it, it's wrong. And so, you know, forget, you know, I, I'm saying this kind of like hyperbolically, but forget uh, the attack on masculinity. I want to start talking about the attack on women, breeders, birth givers, you oh know, my gosh. like, yeah, birthing peoples, birthing peoples that <laughs> we need to really it was bad enough that we laid down and we allowed fatherhood and manhood to just basically be eviscerated mm -hmm. and, and God help us. Right. We yeah. need to stand up for, cause we need to stand up for our women. And we that's where men's role. Women. Yeah. Men that's come back. That's and that's why I, I use this metaphor that men are the castle walls. Women or children are the jewels and the evil ones after the jewels. He's after the children and he's after the women. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that stops them are traditionally oriented men that have boundaries that defend those boundaries. Mm -hmm. And we are then castle walls. Listen, and, and we, we, the walls have fallen in our society. Man, man is the head, but woman is the heart. Yeah. Woman is the heart. And, 
you know, we've the 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 mind the, the head's been lobotomized seemingly. Mm. And we need to wake up and really stand up and defend our women and really defend defend them um in every aspect of it because the reality is that you know in many churches who has the largest icon the mother of god right right we are the last bastion of saying no not only is femininity and womanhood beautiful and blessed motherhood is blessed and this is something that is core and foundational to right. truth to reality to what even god needed a mother to become a man yes and the icon is i think in many ways look i've said this often and i'm going to stand by it a big 2020 we all know what happened there right it seems yeah. like ancient history now <laughs> it's crazy yeah um it was it was about the church it was about the church it was about trying to undermine those seeds um and the the plan is still going forward because what you see now is there's a, another attack and the disorientation, the confusion, right? Mm -hmm. How do you know you're, I think we talked about this the last time, that analogy I like to use about we're on a long trip, right? We're driving, we pass by, we smell a skunk. We didn't hit the skunk, we didn't see the skunk, but we can smell it, right? right? Confusion, whenever there's confusion, you know that's of the enemy. You know, mm -hmm. you, you maybe can't see him, you maybe didn't invite him in, but you sense the confusion around you. You know he's at work. And this confusion where you have even people who would be quote unquote orthodox beginning to weaken and God forbid, give a little bit of leeway, give some quarter to these ideas. Mm -hmm. We can't have it because then everything begins to fall. It's the fabric of reality begins to unwind the logos. Right. right? The order right. of the word, right? Right. So back in the day, right? Um, back in the day of 2020, way back then, right? We should have pulled out the icons and made the processions. Mm. We sh God help those. God help those who have not repented, and I, I, and may God help people to continue to repent of that. But you know, hiding the icon, you know. That was the complete opposite of what I should have yeah. been. What, what, I know many churches wouldn't let you kiss the icons. I went to churches that would not let you kiss the icons. May God forgive them and may those priests repent. And may God give them the courage to repent. We should have been, well, some of us did, but <laughs> they should have been doing processions with the icons. And now we need to do them again with the mother mm. of God with the Holy Saints, St. Elizabeth, St. Lorena, St. Thecla, St. Mary of Egypt. We need to be making processions with the holy women martyrs, the holy women saints, the mother of God and say, this is womanhood. This is right. femininity. This is the image, right? right? Humanity, mankind, we can only understand it with both woman and man together. That's what mankind is. And mm. so we're seeing this second portion and we were we were whittled down the castle walls were were maybe not hit front on but slowly slowly kind of chiseled away at right and now they're trying to get like you said the the jewels and we we can't allow that to happen and we need we need to be bold with the icon we need to do processions especially with the icons of the mother of god we need to proclaim what womanhood is right you have these black mirrors um the women are unprotected because like you said, the men are brainwashed that the head has been lobotomized. And I think the biggest way that they've been able to do that is to get men to pursue their pleasures. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've, I've, I've had non-orthodox guys that talk about masculinity and stuff. Come on. And what my, I have a thing I always ask them is like, what are you willing to die for? Cause me as an orthodox Christian, my, I, the, my line of defense has already been established. You know, my, my tradition, my family, my loved ones, and with the state of the U.S. military industrial complex, I'm not willing to die for that now. Uh, at one point and naive or, or maybe, you know, in my life, when I was more naive and younger, I, I probably would have done that. But earlier in history, when America was maybe less as degenerate as it was, maybe the, there's a worthy cause to die for there. Now it's hard. I can't imagine me doing that. And I definitely wouldn't want my children to do that. 
But I always ask these guys, well, what are you willing to die for? Because some of this manosphere talk and, and trying to get the young boys to talk about masculinity and be a voice for men, it just leads into getting as much money as you can, getting as high social status as you can, and then picking the purest girl you can. And it's like, well, why are you wanting the purest girl? They're still wanting to they're wanting to borrow from a Christian world or a religious worldview at that mm -hmm. of what is femininity, what is valued about femininity. And purity is just something that every culture values about femininity mm -hmm. and women. And you look at our Western culture and it is only fans. It, it's about getting these girls mm -hmm. to begin to be empowered through their sexuality. I call it the Jezebel spirit. Yes. And what what does the Jezebel spirit? Well, King Ahab becomes a simp. That's because right. then he'll get his people to venerate Moloch. He'll get his people to sacrifice their babies because he's a simp to his sexualized wife. That's right. And it's like, that's exactly the state of Western man. That's right. Well, getting back to the icon and you begin to see also one of the problems with, again, a more um, exclusive uh, kind of Western rendering of religious work. It's very sensual. You, you, when, you yeah. take a, when you take a Western... Um, religious depiction, God forgive me, but it, it oftentimes, even if even with the depiction of the mother of God, there's a sensuality that's imbued in it um, that begins to become hitting the kind of hinderlands, the, the edges of sexuality. Mm -hmm. The icon is just so modest in its rendering. It's yeah. so austere in its stylizing, but it's still warm, right? Mm -hmm. That sensuality is important. That's an important thing to understand because the icon doesn't inflame the passions. It cools them. Right. Right. And so anything that would seek to kind of inflame the passions, um, we have to be very careful with. And the Black Mirrors, um, that's, that's what they do in regards of the access and even the way they're designed, like, the saturated colors. I mean, all of these things have an effect. Yes. They, they have an effect. And when we begin to recognize and, and, and really kind of stop and reflect on what it is that we're intaking, but also how we're taking it in, I think that's the first step to making a change, right? right? Because you engage the icon in a certain context. You engage the icon in the context of prayer. You engage the black mirror in a context of leisure mm -hmm. in the context of consuming. Yep. You engage it, unfortunately for a lot of people in a context of transgression. Yep. It's, you know, there's a reason why there's a movement towards guys getting, going back to burners. Right. Yep. Because the smartphone with the image, with the screen has become ubiquitous with transgression. Right. So there's something to that. And this is important because, um, the icon, it's one of the reasons why too, we have to be careful also how we engage the icon because how and how and where you display icons matter as well. Because um, I just want to encourage people, it, it's, it isn't a sin, but we should be very intentional with our engagement of icons and, and how we and where we display them in our homes, mm. right? Um, the, you really shouldn't have an icon in the bathroom. Right. You know what I mean? Um, and we should be very careful not to have icons to be commonplace um, like you would, you know, a George O'Keefe painting somewhere. Right. There, there needs to be an intentionality. I would just share with everyone that intentionality of I'm placing this icon here because even though it's not my prayer corner, I sit here and I do my work and I know I'm tempted. So I want this icon watching me. That type mm -hmm. of energy, right, is it being imbued in that space, prayerfully right. speaking, right? Right. That level of intentionality, we want to play chess, not checkers, right? right? That intentionality, where you're placing the icon, that makes all the difference. Because another thing with the icon is familiarity does breed contempt. And so we want to have our engagement with the icon in such a way that that other that other that holiness that other aspect of it we want to do everything we can to maintain it right we don't want it to become just a commonplace thing that's like oh okay whatever you want to really be like when you see that icon does it make you want to you know do you stop and recognize the room you've walked into 
right? Right. You want to be able to engage, you want to be able to create an environment where someone will come in and it, it'll it'll stop them in their tracks a little bit, mm-hmm. you know? And it's 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 possible because I'd say something, the icon is, is very powerful. If I could tell you just one little quick anecdotal story. So years and years and years ago, before I was a priest and when I was still, you know, a professional tattooer, um, I had my studio and this is a common phenomenon. You know, I, I'd have clients, good people, I, you know, I had clients who were pagans. I had a couple of clients that were witches, you know, that would come in mm-hmm. um, and they would come in and, you know, sometimes with the consultation or maybe after, you know, a, a couple of sessions, they would kind of be comfortable. We'd be talking. And the next thing you know, they start, you know, kind of cursing, cussing, just, you know, people cuss. Mm-hmm. This is something I came, I saw all the time. They go like, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry. It wasn't me going like, shh, 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 don't cuss. Something was telling them the space was different. What was it? It was the icons. Oh, wow. It was the icons. People would always comment. They're like, you know, someone, I'd get a referral. They'd come in. They wouldn't, they wouldn't know what to expect. And they'd be like, you know, kind of weirded out at first. Like, is this a church or is this a studio? Like, what is this? The icon, it it manifests the presence of the saints. It manifests holiness, but it has to be done with intention and prayer, not just with the kind of um, superficial aesthetic of it, right? Because right. it isn't it isn't just a quote unquote picture, right? right. It's a window to heaven to get us full right. circle. Right. You know, some of the stuff that we've recapped then is the narcissism, the way in which it di- it disconnects us from true communion and it can inflame our passions, which is, again, I, I loved. And you mentioned this before, the, how the icons cool our senses where these black mirrors revel them up. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, another part that you mentioned earlier, I want to come back to with these black mirrors is true beauty and true aesthetics. So in its attack on masculinity, which maintains the, the, the energy that maintains these boundaries and then the femininity that that moves in a pluralistic way within those boundaries, both these are under attack. So they've so they're trying to lower these boundaries and then have this sort of radical feminine energy, this Jezebel spirit, as I talk about. And you see this very strange phenomenon where people in their claim to individuality are becoming more and more all like the same person mm-hmm. having the same piercings, the same mm-hmm. tattoos, mm-hmm. the same displays, mm-hmm. the same ways in which to identify themselves as unique. And it's because they're, they're getting their identities of self through this black mirror. Mm-hmm. And so we look through these icons and it shows us how short we're coming to the mm-hmm. full self that we could become. And in a way, people find this to become, you know, they they get on Instagram, they see the beautiful girl with the Ferrari or or the guy with the watch or something. And so, oh, well, it's also showing me how short I'm becoming. But it's it's uh, again, this sort of worldly that the, 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 these are unrealistic in the sense that it's transposing between the eternal heavenly realm and the earthly realm icons where this the over realism of the black of the black mirrors is like drawing us deeper and deeper into the world itself. And this search for authentic identity is, is I think what then is, is causing the law, you know, young men not knowing exactly where to, where to go and who to become because toxic masculinity is toxic. If they're in a public school system, every traditional masculine characteristics condemned. Um, then you, look at the transgenderism phenomenon. This is an exploration of self trying to find my identity, live out my truth, right? Everything is relative. Everything is, is a gender performative uh, phenomenon. So aesthetics are objective Mm -hmm. and the world would love us to say that they're not. And that beauty Mm -hmm. is totally just in the eye of the beholder. And to a degree, it can be absolutely. We all have our tastes and preferences, but aesthetics genuine aesthetics are objective and all these ancient cultures knew that and christian cultures generally knew that be it east and west but you look at today in these black mirrors it's just it looks demonic people are becoming in a way more demonic looking uh do you mind commenting on this process about the the attack how the black mirrors relate to the attack on aesthetics well i think one of the first things is understanding attention you talked about the decline in literacy, right? Yeah. And the decline in literacy is happening because primarily 
the um the sundering of attention right so mm-hmm. the the medium is is designed in such a way to maintain capture attention to hold attention but as that um kind of market of attention began to you know is is increasingly diversifying exponentially what you find is that the com- the competition between um competing you know platforms competing channels whatever for attention that is sundering people's ability to hold attention right yeah now and often deliberate through the companies the silicon oh, valley companies. Intentional. Deli- yeah the del- intentional attention. wrecking of one's ability to focus so what that does then is it plays out in the kind of material world um by people having to become much more screen extreme doing everything to kind of catch the flash quickly right Right. well the icon is the complete opposite of that the icon requires full focus and attention and it it asks you of it and asks for sustained attention Mm -hmm. because the faculty by which we encounter god it's strengthened through sustained attention Mm -hmm. that's why you know, again, I quoted St. Isaac earlier about silence being the language of heaven. Well, silence and stillness, hesekia, that is the way of healing the noose. And the noose being, you know, however you want to look at it, you know, um, fried, shriveled, eviscerated, darkened, <laughs> it it is only healed through the through silence and through that stillness. And Christ is that stillness, mm-hmm. right? You may not be able to encounter it because you don't have a spiritual father with, you know, a guided practice of Jesus prayer, but you do encounter it in Vespers. You do encounter it in the liturgy. You can't encounter it at your home when you, you know, maybe you're meditating on the Psalms in the Psalter, or you're just sitting there in front of your icon. And, and, and that is important because that faculty that perceives God is strengthened in that stillness you have to balance that out if we are all on the phone. So the phone, uh, the, the, the black mirror, excuse me, it is facilitating this short circuiting of the attention. And that short circuit of the attention is now acclimating the faculties for things that are, you know, brighter, um, more extreme, you yeah. know, the extremity, that, yeah, the extremity. And, you know, there's a wisdom to it, but it's sensual and demonic, like James talks about, mm. right? And that wisdom, you know, it works, not for good, but it works. That's why right. you see certain TikTokers, you know, and certain things are so diabolical and degenerate growing because they have that sensual demonic formula down of right. being able to grab the attention quickly, hold it, and pass it on quick enough before the boredom happens, right? Right. So once you're aware of that process, then, you know, prayer needs to be kind of built in such a way to heal and to unhook that process from people. And I think that when we begin to understand that the beauty, the aesthetics that are revealed in the icon are objective, what you can do is you can under, you can say to yourself, I may not understand exactly everything that's going on in this icon, but history has borne out, you know, the Orthodox tradition has borne out because the Orthodox Church makes saints. That's what right. the Orthodox Church does. Still, still, still makes still, saints, still continuing makes sense. to. There's something to this. So you, so you don't need to become some sort of um, expert and explain to everyone every theological symbol that's in an icon of the theophany. You Mm -hmm. just need to be able to sit down long enough and allow it to speak to you. You don't need to give a lecture on the details of the, you know, a nativity icon. You just need to be connected in your heart and to have one point of that icon hit you. Right. Of the reality of the incarnation, you see, this is it's our praxis. And so the icon, the way to undo all of these things is 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 getting back into the praxis of prayer. <laughs> the transfiguration, it's my favorite icon. It's it's my favorite icon. And 
in this icon, we see this process of, you know, purification, illumination, deification. We see all these things happening. We see the communion of the saints. We see the unity of the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see the future kingdom being revealed. We see the living God engaging, encouraging, but also, too, not safe. See, there's an adventure that's there as well. All right. There's an adventure that's there as well. And so we look at this and we see, you know, may we be um, as bold over as the apostles were, you know, may we never be so jaded. And there's so much to sit and to understand just, mm -hmm. just looking at the icon, right? That's what's needed is to sit right. and to pray. Right. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, it, it, it seems like these, uh, again, these black mirrors, you talked about the extremeness and they're, you know, there's all these doctors talking about the dopamine hits. Mm -hmm. And so the bright colors, the getting the likes, mm -hmm. the getting a notification, it's, it's programming us like Pavlovian dogs mm -hmm. to get more dopamine hit, more dopamine hit. And as you just said, the, the asceticism of the church, the quietness to cleanse one noose, the prayerful intention one needs to have. These are things that are not about dopamine hits. No. Now they're it's much more. Yeah, they're the opposite. They're more powerful. They're more meaningful. These are what you need. But the way we're being programmed is is we become dope fiends, not for drugs, but for the which then leads to the drug. It leads to all the other ways in which we're dope fiends, the porn addicts or whatever yeah. it is, the getting the latest Gucci bag or the Hermes. Yeah. It we become addicts through this dopamine process where we cannot just relax. We cannot be who we are. We're constantly really, a lot of people are running away and they're in there. And this is where we, I would love to speak on this, how they're losing the image of God mm -hmm. through the black mirrors. And that is what the whole spiritual, I say this all the time. The whole spiritual game is, is God became a man so that we can become gods to be indirectly engage in his energetic reality. And the whole game is to get you to not engage in those energies, because if you're dead and you don't have any of those energies, you are dead and you right. were dead before you died. But if you're filled with those energies and you die, how could you die? You can't die. They're uncreated. That's right. See, the thing is, is God's created us in his image and, our soul is tripartite because God is Trinity mm. and God's created us to be free. And what we're describing, this demonic energy that comes to us, the constraining of our behavior and our thoughts through the kind of habitual use of the black mirror, it all leads us to a slavery. It leads us to a slavery of the passions. It leads us to a slavery of the world and the mm. tastes of the world. And that slavery is the work of the devil. And it says in the, in the gospel of Mark that Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. And Christ came to free the captives to proclaim liberty. Right. So that proclamation of liberty, where does it happen here and now? Listen, the person who's trying to turn Christ into, you know, some sort of, um, you know, liberation theology in the regards of like looking for some sort of political uh, hero freedom fighters missing the point because what's happening is, is we can become enslaved just as much to our sense of liberty, our sense of, you know, um, what we think is freedom, but it's actually a type of slavery to our own uh, whims and desires. Right. But Christ calls us to a freedom from our desires, a freedom from passions, a freedom from the tyranny that is in this world, which can and does come through whatever soup du jour of your political ideology, right? Whatever soup du jour of the woman you like or the man you like, whatever soup du jour, like whatever the thing is that you are in bondage to, how we define that bondage, meaning that you can't let it go even if you want to. That bondage is what Christ is calling us out of. And we'll never be able to experience that freedom if we don't take a hold of what he's given to us. Right. And that's why the sacraments of the church, that's why the manifestation, what are the sacraments? The sacraments are a material manifestation of a spiritual reality. They're a mystery, right? Something that is being revealed to us, right? 
So getting back full circle again, emotions, God created emotions. Um, he's given them to us for a reason. The fathers are clear. We have anger to fight against our passions and against evil. Mm -hmm. Sadness is given to us to learn appreciation, to learn humility, right? But because of our appetites being wrongly orientated, our emotions are, are, are fallen and have gone awry. We are slaves to their emotions. We need to invite Christ in through the icon, through prayer, through fasting, mm -hmm. through the ascetic life of the church to liberate our inner being, to liberate the, the appetitive part, the, the, the noose, to liberate the, the will. That's, yeah. that's what we need Christ to do, so right. we can be free human beings made in his image again. Because right. the, image that, the, the image is not one of a slave or of a brute animal. Right. And I love that when you're talking about the black mirrors, it's leading to a slavery of our passions. And so in a slave system, you know, your name doesn't really matter. You're just a number. And so we're looking at the world and the depersonalization of everything is indicative of slavery itself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's being, you know, propagated in the name of freedom. And this is where libertarianism, well, what people do in there, it does, it doesn't bother me or my children. Yeah, well, yeah, it does. It and it's not that we need to police what people are doing in there. It's about making standards in society and how we how we engage with people, what we expect of people. And Christ, uh, you know, when 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 Paul talks about being a bond servant or slave to Christ, Christ slavery to Christ is totally to our our willful slavery. That's we right. get a cho we choose that slavery. All other forms of slavery are against your will. That's right. And and this in the slavery that these mirrors are calling, these are against our will. These are things that are happening at you know, uh, embedded psychological processes that you may not be privy to, but to become a, a bond servant to Christ, to be a slave to Christ, that is all about your will choosing that. And you do that with every well, decision you're making. Here's the thing. The slavery that the world is constantly putting us under or, or attempting to, it leads to nothing but death. Yeah. But when you're a slave of Christ, when you're a doulos, when you're a slave of Christ, if you stay in that, you become a son. That's mm. the difference. The slavery of Christ, the slavery of the, the slave of Christ, the bond slave of Christ becomes a son and mm. begins to be transformed and, and inherits a kingdom. Right. The slavery that the world has, the devil has, and has nothing for us but death. Right. That's it. And, and you're seeing it in the people who believe these ideologies. I'm not trying to get political or talk about anything specific, but the death, everything is sterile. All the sex is sterile. Everything is death. The suicide rates, the drug addiction, the everything that they promote is leading to more death, you know, more, more criminality, more crime. Uh, and people, I just talked with, you know, some, some old high school friends today. And they're, they're just, you know, good, generally Protestant Christian guys, but on the conservative scale, they don't do a bunch of reading, but they're asking me about some, where I started getting into it. All of a sudden we started talking about culture and I started talking about the 2030 agenda sure. and they, they just started to pick up on it just because they're, they have families and they're trying to maintain those family boundaries and they're just, they're, they're feeling it. They're feeling the pressure on the world coming in stronger and stronger, and stronger on their kids, on their daughters, on their sons. And, um, well, see, Without, go ahead. For, forgive me. I, no, I, just, go ahead. I think this is really key. Um, this is one of the many reasons. I mean, we could just do a whole nother show now just on this, but it's one of the many reasons why icons aren't um, a kind of optional accoutrement. Like we just had some of orthodoxy. They're dogmatic right. for a reason. Right. Because the boundaries... The icon, if we want to see the icon as a wall now, as, as the wall of a oh, castle. I love that. I love that. Right? There's, there's a reason for that. And more than, listen, I'm not going to say what someone can or cannot do, um, but I, I will tell you this. I don't really care how well armed you are. I don't care how well trained you are. There's always someone bigger and badder and one man can't take on 20 and 50 men can't take on a platoon. It just, right. you know what I mean? It's not the movies. Right. But the, the, the defense that the icon builds spiritually 
nothing can penetrate that. Right. The the faith that's transmitted through the meta culture of the church that's manifested through the icon. Someone could take me away next week, but I have confidence that my sons, my biological sons, my spiritual sons, my biological daughters, my spiritual daughters, they'll still carry on mm -hmm. because that fortification that's been transmitted to them of Christ and his saints and theosis, that's what the icon does. And that's why it isn't a optional thing. And right. that's why, you know, allies, Protestant Christians, conservative people who maybe don't have faith yet, you need to get this because the icon provides something for you. It provides a spiritual and psychic shield that cannot be erased. Right. I, I spoke about this uh, more recently on my journey through orthodoxy, and I'm basically four years orthodox at this point. So still, still a baby, but at least enough experience. And I entered the church with the whole background and learning the theology. So I came through the head and now it's finally, when I talked about how it finally reached my heart is when 2020 happened, I was anxious about the world. I knew, you know, medical procedures were going to come in 2021 mm -hmm. that weren't going to be what they promised. Mm -hmm. This was part of something that we had been talking about for years. Um, and so talking about the digital currencies, the great reset, all this stuff, and it would give me anxiety. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't have the money. I don't have a homestead. I don't have my wife yet. And then as I've, but th constantly going to church, participating in the Eucharist, participating in the liturgy, that was consistent through my life. And by the time it's like mid 2021, um, I have, I have very little anxiety and, and, and I engage with all this detritus of the world, mm -hmm. constantly, just given what I do, but it's like, I can only control what I can control in my own free choices. And that's what God's going to judge me on. That's right. And the idea that I was going to go create a place in which I'll be protected. This is, this is where my, my faith and my relationship with God is that grew deeper. Uh, my holding on to trying to do something in the world to stop it from happening. I began to let go of it because that's outside my pay grade. That's outside what I can do. And you know, God's providence Put me here in 2023. I wasn't. I wasn't born in 1900. I wasn't born in the 1500s. Mm -hmm. My salvation, for some reason, God put me here because my salvation is tied to how I resist the world today. That's right, and that's true for all of us that are alive right now. That's right. And so I found in my own spiritual journey. Now I have very little anxiety. There's still a lot of things I want to do. I, I, God willing, I hope I have more time to do the things that I want to do. But. Um, it's like, as long as I, if I focus on what I can control now, it's like, I'm ready. I can't, I, God, don't put me to the test. I don't want to be a martyr. I don't, but I can feel where my heart has totally moved to a point where it's not about me having all my weaponry and my right. homestead and defending my kids. It's about, well, I'm going to do the best I can today. And I hope, you know, I, I hope God will be with me and, and we'll see what, the, how things are tomorrow. And that has just totally alleviated some of this internal anxiety where I, again, as you said, Christ is that sort of salvific wall of defense that when you, when, and this is true for Orthodox Christians, this is true for all types of Christians. I think it's a good metric is like, how much anxiety are you, are you going to vote your way out of this as, as right. the, you know, the MAGA boomer? You're not. So, okay, now the election since 2020, 2022, they're not real. What are you going to do now? That's right. Well, you got right. to get in That's line good. with God and let go of it and let that anxiety pass away. And, and forgive me. I'm going to, maybe this is super pedantic. Me, I don't know, but I just want to bring it back to the icon again. Yeah. Because one of the things is that outside the church, when people talk about Christianity, especially the context that you're speaking of, which we would agree about, you know, in regards of, you know, the sliding into madness due, liberal, due, due to extreme liberalism, all these things, that's all there. But it's more than just kind of abstract idea, right? The Christianity we're talking about is incarnational. Yeah. And I know this sounds too simplistic for people, but when you look at an icon, like an actual icon of Christ, if you are willing to take the time that thing will begin to unfold in front of you. Not just the icon itself of like, okay, well, this is wood and this is paint and this is the incarnation. You can start going into the fact of like, what did Christians do when the fall with the fall of Byzantium? 
What did Christians do when the Soviets began to take over? You know, you can start. Why did they smuggle icons? You know what I mean? (laughs) Sometimes that simple solution, that simple explanation is, is, is the one that's needed. There's something about the tangible reality of our faith. There's something about the fact that our faith is rooted in history. It isn't just some sort of abstract kind of meandering of thoughts and philosophies. The icon makes that tangible. Right. It communicates that in a coherent way. That even if you are dumb as a box of rocks, you get it. There's something very powerful about that. And there's something very powerful about the fact that you may have an icon that if you were raised in the church, your great grandmother prayed in front of. And if you've only been in the church for 32 days, there's something powerful and meaningful and true about you praying in front of an icon and you pass that down to your daughter and then her granddaughter. You understand what I mean? Mm-hmm, it's, mm-hmm. It's, it, it's anchoring us into something. Right. Patriarch Pavle, who's a saint, um, Serbian patriarch, he says, essentially, you don't get to choose what nation what time period that you're born in, right? What you do get to choose is how you're going to live that experience. And I would say that it isn't as loose and difficult and frightful as people think it is because the icon, it anchors us into tradition and I can anchor myself into that tradition. And that is an anxiety killer Mm. because the unknown really isn't that unknown. We know where we're headed. We look into the icon, we know we're headed towards the kingdom of heaven. You know, the problem with trying to build, I'm all, I mean, I'm all about homesteading. I'm all about those things. You know, we've got our own little urban farm here. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we can't be neo Kiliists, right? We can't be looking for a, a temporal kingdom here and now. Right. Right. There's a tension as Christians. We build schools, we build churches, we build temples, we paint icons, right? We write icons because we know that we have to hold the fort down till the Lord comes. But at the end of the day, this isn't the end goal. This isn't the last stop, right? We're occupying territory until the king comes. And that's the way we have to kind of, you know, live it out. Yeah. I think that's a perfect point to end our conversation on um, fighting the devil's iconography. Uh, Father Turbo, thank you so much. We have some super chats. If you have a few more minutes to answer some questions, I know some people had some specific questions for you. Uh, thank you so much for for coming on today. That thing always a joy. It's I think a powerful the conversation. Um, first super chat came from Simon the Amputee. Said much love to Father Turbo. From the San Gabriel Valley, Simon the Amputee, he will be at uh, Orthodox Montanica. And yeah. let me throw that banner on there. That's it. And you're going to be there. I cannot wait to meet yeah. you. I'm the only non clergy invited. So uh, I'm honored <laughs> that Father Deacon great. would ask me, but I cannot wait to meet you in person as well. That was one great. of the going to be the highlights. So I'll definitely be giving you a big hug when we meet. Um, but yeah, for everybody, June 7th through 11th is Montanica, uh, changed a little bit of the spelling, made it more orthodox. Shout out to Father Deacon. Butte, Montana this year going to be a lot of fun. If you guys can make it, definitely do. Uh, next super chat came from our good sister. I love every interview with Father Turbo. God bless, says Moon. Uh, God bless you. $1.99. God bless you. Um, Chase Haggard said, what an awesome stream, DPH. Thank you, Father Qualls. Shout out to Chase Haggard. He's a good uh, Orthodox apologist here in our community. And David Franco Jr. throws in $4.99 and says, Father Turbo, would you recommend not to have icons in your room? I rent a room, so it is my only space, but I also am not clean at all times in my room. David, you you better put an icon in there. (laughs) I would put an icon in there, icon of the mother of God, icon of Christ, icon of your guardian angel. Um, And just just realize that, um, you know, we got to be careful not to engage the icon superstitiously, right? Because the reality is is that God is, is a God of love. And, you know, 
the icon, if anything else, it's going to just call you up to just another level of dignity. And we could all be better at that. But absolutely, David, get an icon in there. May be blessed. Excellent. Uh, Ivan over on Rockfin threw in a super chat and said, um, thanks for this. Love you both. Pray for me. Blessed Lent comes from Ivan. Uh, $5 over on Rockfin. God bless you, Ivan. Bless you, Ivan. Thank you so much. Um, now we have a handful of super chats over here on Stream Labs. Let me pull some of those up. Uh, first one comes from Joseph Chase, throws in three dollars and said, "Excited to see you at Montanica." I believe he's talking to you. Your stream on humility with DPH was so impactful. And that was the last one we did was theology of humility, and the one before that was the dark light of the occult. Um, I share it often. I recommend your church to a friend who became your catechumen and is being baptized soon. Grateful for the role you played in her journey. Glory to God. God bless you. God bless you. And may God continue to bless your desire and your work for the, for the kingdom. Amen. Uh, next super chat comes from uh, Po Pograttle. Pograttle throws in $2 and says, great content lately, DPH. Uh, keep up the good work. Always a great conversation when Father Turbo is present. Maybe get Father Turbo in contact with Jonathan Paggio. Could be a very interesting conversation. God bless you both, uh, Father Bless. So thank you bless so you much. Day, party. God bless you. I did have a conversation set up with Jonathan Paggio. It's supposed to be this Thursday, but I just got an email yesterday that they have to reschedule until after Pascha. So I'm looking forward to that one. Hopefully, hopefully to dive into some logos theology archetypes and semiotics with uh, with Paggio when that becomes available next uh this is somebody that you're going to know who's who's near and dear to your heart and your computer uh pbf live throws in 25 dollars <laughs> and says thank you as always well thank you brother for the support god bless you i truly bless do appreciate you. it god bless love you um podramos throws in five dollars and says father bless could you explain sigils and their influence on us there's a few there's a few questions here so if you want to start with that one i'll go to the next one sure uh, blessing the lord be upon you um sigils work um unfortunately um so i just want to say this one part because you can find lots of stuff but the one thing that i'll say that i think a lot of people won't talk about is that sigils work on people imperceptibly, actually. Um, and so that's why there is a measure of just kind of being aware of what you are seeing and looking at because um, they are imbued and with, with a certain type of energy and they can work on us imperceptibly. So um, they can, you know, hearken um, and, and be heralds to um, unwanted energy and experiences. So just kind of be... Be savvy and be prayerful, you know. Be careful yeah. about what you're be careful about what you are are watching through the screen. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot of people. I'll give you a great example and I'll, I'll shut up after this. Um, but there's a there's a creator who I you you know I'm a I'm a big fan of, you know, I really appreciate a lot of his work. But the thing is, is whether someone's intentional or not about it, it kind of doesn't really matter. Um, but there's there's a creator, Mike Mignola creative hellboy who there's a lot of imagery that he pulls um which whether it's intentional or not has actual connection and root to um demonic energy and, and entities and so if you're not aware of that um it can affect you in a way that you know you may not realize you know this um this is gets us back to what some people would call the evil eye and things like that but mm -hmm. um there's a reality to that which you've talked about at length yeah. so you know again we shouldn't we we have not been given over to a spirit of fear but of adoption by which you cry out abba father um but it's just it's important that if you've been baptized and chrismated and you're in the church listen to your conscience a little bit because your guardian angel and Holy Spirit will speak to you about, you know, if you're watching something and something's not feeling right, like just turn it off. If you're somewhere and just, you know, you're seeing some things, you're not sure, just, you know, make the sign of the cross and just kind of like divert your attention from from things that are making you uncomfortable. Because there's probably a reason why. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Then he followed up with. 
How do Christian symbols, cross, and icons differ from sigils? Is it by them being vessels of grace endued with divine energy over the demonic? My family thinks orthodoxy is black magic, and they are Protestants. Yeah, so no, um, it's it's all about the intent, right? Um, because, well, I'll put it this way. Um, the give me just a great example to prove my point an upside down cross what is an upside down cross well, uh it was the cross that peter was crucified on but it's also a satanic symbol correct so is it contingent yes and no right um i look at an upside down cross because i understand what the original intent and what its origin is right and i understand that it's there to communicate the martyrdom of peter but the fact of the matter is, is someone can someone can and does take that image, and even though it's linked to the martyrdom of Peter, they now imbue it with a negative energy. Mm -hmm. So the fact of the matter is, is you know, just like unfortunately, sometimes sacred things have been defiled, they need to be blessed again, right? Mm -hmm. So right. it's it's the same thing with with a symbol um, that it, it can often be defiled and it needs to be um, needs to be blessed. Right. And there's mm -hmm. that's a whole other conversation. But I think it gets to the yeah. kind of heart of it. And, and related to that, I'll just say that some people confuse miracles and magic. And the difference being is God's will. So magic is about the manifestation of the magician's will and their intentional desire. Whereas a miracle doesn't matter how much I desire it or not. It only can come true through God's will. Mm -hmm. And so it seems and God's will is always love. Yeah. That, that seems uh, in, for to non-believers, that seems semantical, but from a believer's perspective, it's a it's a chasm, a difference between a magical ritual of one's individual will versus certainly I can pray for things and, and wish they would happen. But I don't perform uh, ritualistic processes to um, to that their percentage may be increased into its likelihood. Uh, so magic and miracles are not the same thing. Well, we talked about that before, DPH. We talked about. You know, forgive me, but the mechanics between rape and, you know, the, the the love between a husband and a wife, the mechanics are similar, but they couldn't be further apart. Right. Yeah, it's a great point. And if you guys want to hear more about that, go check out our last talk or two talks ago on the dark light of the occult. Our sister, Amp Town One, who now goes to my parish, uh, God bless her. She throws in one dollar. No comment. Um and then Keenan throws in a super chat uh, for five dollars. Says on Clean Monday, I was doing my evening prayers, and a passion invoking image that I had seen that day kept popping up and distracting me. It was an image I barely paid attention to. God showed me how potent even the most mm -hmm. minuscule images are to our souls. And I, I will confess, since Lent started, um, I have definitely felt an increase of the passions, my own passions ramping up. Um, just weird things, weird things, weird mental images mm -hmm. uh, have popped up in my head, weird mm -hmm. things. And and I know this is common for most people. I, I always tell people when they're getting baptized, welcome to the arena yep. to, to let them know this isn't, you know, this isn't a prosperity gospel. This is the real thing. So two things. It's wonderful if you're seeing an uptick in, in your passions during Lent, because it means that the Bunsen burners on something's cooking. <laughs> right that's that's what you want right that's what I you want that. the the impurities are getting heated up it means that you're actually praying it means that you're actually fasting it means that you're actually engaged right yeah you know i mean dph you know you're no stranger i can see your arms right how do you know you're getting a good workout you gotta you gotta have a little bit of if there's too much pain where you're getting injured something's wrong Right. But if there's no resistance, if there's no burn, then the muscle's not breaking down in the way that it needs to. Right. right. So you want to encounter the right kind of resistance. And so when we begin to see images popping up like that, it's a good thing, especially if you have a guided practice of Jesus prayer, um, a guided practice of fasting, because those images, they're not easily burned out, but they can be eventually with, with grace um, and with consistent turning to the Lord. We can be delivered of things, you know, but it, it's not an easy process. It takes right. work. It, it's not at all. 
And uh, yeah, I, I've noticed that. But that's one of the things I try to tell men about orthodoxy is um, it has been I've, I've put my toes in a lot of different spiritual practices throughout my life. Um, and orthodoxy is the only one that is one consistently so deep. I am ahead. So I read and I consume information. I don't even feel like I've got close to even touching the bottom of orthodoxy. These other worldviews, I feel like I've dove in and it's 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 fun. And then eventually I touch the bottom and then I kind of push off and go back up to the top. Orthodoxy is so deep. Yeah. It just I it just the bottom keeps going and going and going. But then it's also it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. It is it is not easy whatsoever. But like you with the fitness analogy, that's to me what makes it more real than anything. I can come up with, you know, logical arguments or why I believe it to be the one true religion, but it's, it's the spirit, the internal spiritual reality that you can't articulate to somebody that's like, dang, this thing is so difficult. Dang, these demonic attacks are real. Mm -hmm. Dang, what is going on? And that's what, mm -hmm. um, and I, again, I, that's why I think diving deeper into that for me, transform the anxiety of even having to deal with and, and do commentary on the state of the world constantly from a Christian perspective. It's like, now it doesn't bother me as much, you know, seeing the degeneracy or if they steal an election or it's like, well, what'd you expect? What'd you, know, you expect? God. <laughs> what'd you expect? That's right. And ultimately that's why, you know, this, again, this has key, this is St. Gregor Palamas, the Jesus prayer and, and the practice of stillness. It isn't just for the monks. It's for the Christian who wants to be healed. It's the therapy of the church. It's it's how it happens. And I'm telling you, I'm not telling you because that's the soup du jour and that's the way to kind of talk to be authentically orthodox. I'm telling you because Christ has healed me from incredible, my own incredible, like I, the world didn't do it to me. I did it to myself. Mm. So this is what I'm, I'm saying. I've experienced the healing of Christ. That's why I'm talking about the ways, the things I'm talking about. Christ can heal you. Right. If Christ Amen. can heal me, he can heal you. Mm. And then our last two super chats, Justin with no comment throws in $10. Thank you so much, Justin. And Nectarios DD uh, throws in $5 and says, love y'all. We'll love you, Nectarios. Thank that you so much, perfect. brother, for your support and that does it that concludes all oh we got one more super chat that just popped up here um father turbo i'm being attacked during lent in my dreams i normally have dreamless sleep but during lent i wake up many times per night with from vivid disturbing dreams how to deal okay so here's the thing, Jeremy, try this. Talk to your spiritual father first and foremost, see what he says for you, but drink a little bit of holy water before you go to bed. Um, pray, you know, there's this prayer um, that God arise that is in his to be scattered. Find that prayer, um, make the sign of the cross over your bed. And then if it keeps happening, well, and then ask God to um, guide you and to, don't necessarily ask him to lift it, but say, Lord, what are you trying to, to, to show me? And then when you wake up, pray, get a Psalter. When you wake up from these dreams, get a Psalter, light your lampada, light your vigil lamp, start reading the Psalter, pray the Our Father, right? Say the Jesus prayer slowly, gently with the blessing of your spiritual father. And God may just be calling you to, to prayer. Mm -hmm. He may be allowing this time of temptation to come so that you can develop a rhythm of prayer and, and deeper communion with him. But whatever the result is, just know that God's allowed it for your salvation. He loves you. He's drawing you to something. So speak to your spiritual father, have confession. Think about the things I submitted to you. And I have no doubt that in time, God's going to uh, be triumphant in this situation with you. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend uh, putting an icon in your bedroom? Get yourself a guardian angel. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I got, I got my guardian angel. I have my patron saint in my bedroom right there. Yeah uh saint patrick so i have one of saint patrick over me and by the way that breastplate of saint patrick yes one of the best prayers ever mm -hmm. god with me god beside me yep. absolutely well father turbo that looks like that does it uh thank you so much again for coming on thank you for your ministry thank you for everything you do uh hopefully we can do another one in the near future before montanica 
Yeah. I know that you're very busy. You're like booked out like a month ahead. Like you're, you have to be one of the busiest priests. I, I know. Uh, well, you uh, and Father Josiah Trenum. Father Josiah Trenum has a whole team around him. But yeah. <laughs> I just got four nuns. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyways, uh, anything you'd like to say to the people before we hop off, how they could reach out to you or find you? I know that you uh, it looks like the Royal Path podcast. You guys have been doing great. I've been wanting to reach out to Cyprian and do a stream with him. Oh, you should. Time. You should reach out to Cyprian. You guys would set this thing on fire. So you and Cyprian, that'd be a great one. But yeah, you guys can um, find me in Royal Path. Um, you can reach out uh, my email, um, the parish website. Um, if you got questions, you know, um, I'm, I just, I want to help if I can. Um, and I would just say, um, we have the uh, St. Elizabeth sisterhood here. And one of the ministries of the nuns is they make baptismal robes. So if anyone's coming into the church or you got God kids, mm. you know, um, um, uh, St. Mary of Egypt.net, uh, the St. Elizabeth sisterhood here in Kansas city, please, um, at least, you know, take a look and see if maybe the sisters could, provide you with some baptismal robes. It helps support their ministry here uh, in the heart of Kansas City, where we are trying to hold it down with prayer and with uh, Orthodox hospitality. So um, check that out. All right. Well, everybody, I will be back Thursday. Um, if not, I'll be back Friday with Jay Dyer. Jay Dyer will be on and we'll be talking about ecumenicism and the death of the truth. And we'll be talking about why we have to be on our toes in regards to ecumenicism and, and getting inside orthodoxy because fundamentally it promotes relativism, which is the epistemology of the devil. And that is then the death of truth, uh, which is so uh, we'll be doing that Friday. Uh, but I plan on doing a stream Thursday. I'll, you'll find out what it's about, as will I then. But um, uh, until then, as always, everyone, God bless. God bless you. Amen.